is passed and without a I demand the A's and the nays. Gentleman from Michigan. I ask for the A's and the nays. Does the gentleman ask for a recorded vote? A recorded vote, please. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five minute vote. This is the vote on final passage for reauthorizing the 1994 Violence Against Women Act for five years through uh, 2017. It authorizes $660 million per year for grant and assistance programs under the act, including law enforcement training programs and programs to help victims of domestic violence. It differs from the Senate passed version of the bill in that the, uh, it omits new protections for victims of domestic violence who are gay and lesbian, immigrants and American Indians. It also imposes new rules for domestic violence grant programs. And this is a five minute vote. Final passage.
Hill. Mr. Gingry of Georgia. Mr. Gingry of Georgia votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 222, the nays are 205. The bill is passed without objection. A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the question on suspending the rules and passing H.R. 2621 as amended, which the clerk will report by title. Union calendar number 331, H.R. 2621, a bill to establish, establish the Chimney Rock National Monument in the state of Colorado and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? So many as are in favor, say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The chair lays before the House a message. To the Congress of the United States, pursuant to the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, I hereby report that I have issued an executive order declaring a national emergency with respect to the unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States posed by the actions and policies of certain members of the government of Yemen and others to threaten Yemen's peace, security, and stability. The order does not target the entire country of Yemen or its government, but rather targets those who threaten the peace, security, or stability of Yemen, including by obstructing the implementation of the agreement of November 23, 2011, between the government of Yemen and those in opposition to it, which provides for a peaceful transition of power that meets the legitimate demands and aspirations of the Yemeni people for change, or by obstructing the political process in Yemen. The order provides criteria for the blocking of property and interests in property of persons determined by the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Secretary of State to have engaged in acts that directly or indirectly threaten the peace, security, or stability of Yemen, such as acts that obstruct the implementation of the agreement of November 23, 2011, between the government of Yemen and those in opposition to it, which provides for a peaceful transition of power in Yemen, or that obstruct the political process in Yemen, be a political or military leader of an entity that has engaged in the acts described above, have materially assisted, sponsored, or provided financial material or technological support for, or goods or services to or in support of, the acts described above, or any person whose property 
and interests and property are blocked pursuant to the order. The designation criteria will be applied in accordance with the with applicable federal law, including, where appropriate, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. I have delegated to the Secretary of the Treasury, in consultation with the Secretary of State, the authority to take such actions, including the promulgation of rules and regulations, and to employ all powers granted to the President by IEEPA, as may be necessary to carry out the purposes of the order. All agencies of the United States government are directed to take all appropriate measures within their authority to carry out the provisions of the order. I am, I am enclosing a copy of the executive order I have issued. Signed, Barack Obama, the White House. Referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs and ordered printed. Me on. To clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further proceedings today on the motion to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered on which the vote occurs, incurs objection under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Any recorded vote on the po postponed question will be taken later. The House will be in order. Be in order. House will be in order. House will be in order. Will all members who are conversing please take those conversations off the House floor? For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Illinois rise? Uh, Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 5740. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 5740, a bill to extend the national flood insurance program and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Illinois, Mrs. Biggert, and the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from, uh, from Illinois. Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and to add extraneous materials on this bill. Without objection, but the gentlewoman will suspend. Will members please take conversations off the House floor? Will members please take conversations off the House floor? Gentlewoman from Illinois. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to ask my colleagues for their support of H.R. Uh, 5740, the National Flood Insurance Program Extension Act. The program is set to retire on, on May 31st, and this critical legislation will spare property owners and the housing market from another lapse in F NFIP. It extends the National Flood Insurance Program's authorization for 30 days until June 30th. In addition, it would initiate several non-controversial reforms to develop private sector options in the flood insurance market. Like many of my colleagues, especially my good friend and co-sponsor of both this bill and our long-term reauthorization, uh, the gentlelady from California, Maxine Waters, I am frustrated that the House must consider yet another short-term extension. It has been 10 months since the House sent H.R. 1309, a comprehensive bipartisan reform and a five-year reauthorization measure to the Senate. Our Committee on Financial Services approved H.R. 1309 by a unanimous vote of 54 to 0 in the committee, and it, pa and it passed on the House floor by a vote of 406 to 22. As part of the process, we secured the input and support of groups representing the views of everyone from taxpayers to businesses to wildlife defenders. And yet, after five additional short-term extensions, the Senate has not still considered any legislation to the reform NFIP. Instead, all we hear are excuses and rumors that the administration doesn't want Congress to look productive, that the floor time in the Senate is too precious, or that Senate leaders simply don't want to deal with possi possible difficult amendments. The time for excuses has run out. This program is more than $17 billion in debt to the taxpayers. We owe it to the t homeowners, to the housing market, and to taxpayers to begin the process of fixing this program, even if we must do it 30 days at a time. Today we are sending to the Senate H.R. 5740. Should the Senate pass this short-term extension bill, it will have around six weeks from today to take up a flood reform measure and send it to the House. In the meantime, this 30-day extension will initiate key elements of our bipartisan House pass reforms. It opens the door to private sector participation by asking FEMA and the GAO to study the cost and feasibility of private reinsurance as well as the private market's cap capacity to provide new options for homeowners. It also says that private insurance coverage can take the place of government coverage to meet the requirements of lenders in flood-prone areas. The sooner we begin making these changes, the sooner taxpayers can stop bearing the full expense and risk of an outdated flood program. And over the next six weeks, the Senate will have more than enough time to pass long-term reform. Again, last July, the House passed H.R. 1309 by an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, 40, 406 to 22. The House then sent this tax to the Senate two additional times. In December, the House passed flood reform as part of H.R. 3630, the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. And last week, the House passed this, the same flood me reform measure as part of H.R. 5652, the Reconciliation Act. But this isn't like other partisan battles. It should not be that difficult. Even the White House is with us. In September 2011, President Obama released a statement in, reform, in support of our reforms as part of his plan for economic growth and debt reduction because the House bill would spare taxpayers from billions in losses. And Senate Banking Committee Chairman Johnson has secured committee approval of his own version, uh, S. 1940, along with strong bipartisan support. And in February, 41 senators, Republicans and Democrats, sent a letter to Senate leadership asking that the Senate leaders Reed and McConnell schedule flood insurance reform for floor consideration. There is simply no reason that in the next few days we cannot sit down and reconcile any differences that remain between the House and Senate versions for flood reform. And today's legislation will give the Senate time to make that a possibility. It will also begin the process of fixing NFIP and protecting taxpayers from unnecessary risk. 
I urge my colleagues to support uh, this, uh, this bill because this program is too important to let lapse and too in debt to continue without reform. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman reserves the balance of her time. Gentleman from Georgia. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you very much. The National Flood Insurance Program plays a very, very key role in our nation's efforts to prevent and recover from flood disasters. Floods are now the number one natural disaster in the United States in terms of lives lost and property damaged. Now here is exactly what the National Flood Insurance Program does. First, it identifies areas of flood risk. Secondly, it encourages communities to implement measures to mitigate against the risk of flood loss. Thirdly, it provides financial assistance to help individuals recover more rapidly from flooding disasters, and it lessens the financial impact of flood disasters on individuals, on businesses, and all levels of government. In recent years, a series of short-term reauthorizations and temporary suspensions of the NFIP have eroded confidence in the program among our stakeholders, including state government, tribal governments, local communities, individual poly policyholders, mortgage lenders, and the private insurance industry. In addition to disrupting the program's day-to-day -day operations, short-term reauthorizations and temporary suspensions like what we're doing here in 30 days is creates significant uncertainty regarding the federal government's long-term commitment to underwriting and indemnifying flood losses. So in the absence of such a commitment, our stakeholders are less likely to make the necessary investments that are needed to successfully sustain, strengthen, and grow the program, thereby undermining the program's effectiveness and efficiency over time. As my colleague mentioned earlier, uh, Ms. Speaker, Congress last passed a bill to extend the National Flood Insurance Program authorization on December 23, 2011, five months ago. As a part of the full year omnibus program, omnibus appropriations bill for fiscal year 2012. Even prior to this action, we in the House took decisive action to extend the flood insurance program in July the way it should be by approving a five-year flood insurance reform reauthorization bill last July that passed this House on a strongly bipartisan Republican and Democratic vote of 406 to 22. Unfortunately, the National Flood Insurance Program is set now to expire May 31st, just over two weeks from today. And guess what? June 1st, also happens to mark the official start of the hurricane season in this country. This lets you know how we have got to put pressure on the Senate to act responsibly. Here we are, attempting to pass a 30-minute, 30 30-year, 30 30-day 30 month, 30 extension, just two weeks before the devastating hurricane season starts. Urgency is necessary here. This is why reauthorizing of the National Flood Insurance Program before it expires is essential to our nation's efforts to prevent and recover from flood disasters. So I'm pleased that the bill that we have before us does extend it for the program for 30 days, um, and, um, but it is not a perfect bill, as I said. I believe that many in this chamber, just about everybody in the House of Representatives, would prefer to see the Senate take up and pass our bill for the five-year extension, H.R. 1309. Short of that, I believe that many on our side would prefer to take up the flood extension bill that would provide a clean extension. In addition, there is the possibility, count it, it was two weeks to go, who knows, the Senate simply may not agree to an extension that only runs 30 days and includes authorization provisions. We just learned last evening that the junior senator from Oklahoma, Senator Tom Corbin, objected to the majority leader's request to take up and approve a clean short-term extension bill that would extend the program until December 31st, 2012. So here we are two weeks before the hurricane season starts, and this bill, the, the, the flood program runs out, 
and still no action from the Senate. So I think it is also important to note that while this body repeatedly has voiced concern uh, with spending, particularly with spending that is not offset with cuts, the Congressional Budget Office has indicated this bill will cost $2 million over five years, an amount that is not offset in this bill. Despite some of these shortcomings, I believe it is of utmost importance that we avoid any lapse in the program, any lapse regardless of the duration, which uh, would cause significant dislocation in our very fragile housing market for borrowers unable to complete mortgage closing, for insurance agents that sell national flood insurance policy as a part of their business, and for insurance companies that may be forced to reevaluate their voluntary participation. Our national flood insurance programs own right your own program. All are, are very vital. And finally, we have a broad coalition of stakeholders who support the bill, who support the five-year uh, extension including industry insurance trade groups, floodplain managers, the realtors who are holding their annual conference in Washington, D.C. this week, many other groups. In addition, FEMA's administrator, Mr. Greg Fulgate, recently sent a letter to Congress urging approval of the extension. So here we are. We've got to pass this 30-day 30, uh, 30 extension. And just in conclusion, I just want to add that thanks to Ms. Bickard and to Ms. Waters, we were able to do something that was vitally needed. As many of you know, my state of Georgia was devastated with floods. And one of the things that did come out of this is during the hardship times, very difficult for individuals to pay for the flood insurance in a lump sum. As we have made par uh, part of our, our extension effort, they can now play in quarterly installments. And that's a great thing. Um, and with that, uh, I will reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentlewoman from Illinois. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from uh, Alabama, uh, the uh, chairman of the Financial Services Committee, Mr. Baca. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized for three minutes. I thank the uh, uh, gentlelady. Uh, we're here on the floor discussing this bill for one reason and for one reason only, and that's that the Senate has not done their job. Ten months ago, Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker, uh, this House passed a bipartisan long-term reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. Our bill passed unanimously out of committee and then passed the House overwhelmingly with over 400 votes, Democrats and Republicans joining together. Our bill not only included a five-year reauthorization of the program, a long-term reauthorization, which is what's needed, but included many needed reforms that reduced the burden on taxpayers, increased private market participation, and helped bring certainty to the housing market. We did our job, Madam Speaker, but the Senate's failed to do their job. Seventeen temporary extensions. Perhaps none of us should be surprised. After all, it's been three years since the Senate even bothered to pass a budget. Not to mention, at a time when millions of Americans are out of work, the Senate has failed to vote on 27 job-creating bills we passed out of the House overwhelmingly. Now, Majority Leader Harry Reid has failed to find time to schedule floor time, even though the Senate, uh, under the leadership of Chairman Johnson and uh, Ranking Member Shelby, unanimously passed a bill almost identical to the bill we passed 10 months ago. But because of a dysfunctional Senate that's not working, we're once again faced with the risk of having the flood insurance shut down, as the gentleman from Georgia said, right before hurricane season starts. I can't think of a worse time. A shutdown of flood insurance, even a temporary one, would do tremendous damage to our struggling economy and our nation's fragile housing market. Specifically, what does it mean? I'd like to introduce without objection a letter from the National Realtors. It is already delaying close to 1,300 uh, house closings uh, every day. Uh, it, um, if it expires, it will stop uh, all development dead in its track in 21,000 communities across America. 
Let me close by saying I want to commend our colleague, Mrs. Bigger. Congresswoman Biggert has done an exceptional job on this important issue. I'd like to commend uh, Congresswoman and Ranking Member Maxine Waters. They've worked over the last uh, year for a long-term reauthorization. We've come together and done our job. I would like to commend the Senate, but unfortunately the Senate is not working. It's time for the Senate to pass a five-year bill and it's time for them to pass it immediately. That's why, although we have passed a five-year reauthorization, we're here, but we're only passing a one-month extension because the best they can do is another extension, number 17, which would put it into December when we all know that's a lame duck Congress and we're going to be confronted with tremendous other issues at that time. The gentleman's time has expired. To the Senate, I say, let's get going. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Yes. I'd like to uh, recognize for uh, two minutes the distinguished lady from California, Ms. Waters. The lady thank from you California very much. is recognized. I'd like to thank um, Representative Scott for his leadership uh, on this issue. I'd like to thank Chairman Baucus for his support uh, for all of the work that has gone into uh, flood insurance reform. I rise today in support of H.R. 5740, the National Flood Insurance Program Extension Act of 2012, but more than anybody, I'd like to thank Representative Biggert for her hard work on this bill and flood insurance reform, and I'm pleased to co-sponsor this legislation. While this bill by no means is a substitute for the comprehensive set of reforms included in H.R. 1309, the Flood Insurance Reform Act, a bipartisan bill which passed the House last year, <coughs> I believe that we must act to pass this bill <coughs> so that the flood insurance program does not lapse. The flood insurance program provides valuable protection for approximately 5.5 million homeowners. Unfortunately, the lack of a long-term authorization has placed the program at risk. The program lapsed three times in 2010. These lapses meant FEMA was not able to write new policies, renew expiring policies, or increase coverage limits. Given the current crisis in the housing market, this instability in the flood insurance program is hampering that market's recovery and must be addressed. The current authorization for the flood insurance program expires on May 31st. The next day, hurricane season begins. It is irresponsible to have our nation's homeowners vulnerable to flooding at any time, but to allow such a lapse during hurricane season is especially troubling. Even though this bill only extends the program for 30 days, I hope that this brief window will give our counterparts in the Senate enough time to pass their flood insurance reform bill so that this program has all of the resources it needs to fully serve homeowners and the communities in which they live. I strongly urge and I vote on this bill in the hope that the next flood insurance bill we vote on is a comprehensive reauthorization bill. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I yield two and one half uh, minutes to the gentlelady from uh, Michigan, uh, Mrs. Miller. The gentlelady from Michigan is recognized. Two and a half minutes. Mr. Speaker, I certainly appreciate the gentlelady uh, yielding time to me, especially because I am opposed to this bill. And I would just have one question for my colleagues, and I would ask this. What in the world is the federal government doing in the national flood insurance business? I mean, I would give the sponsors, certainly, of this legislation credit for the fact that they're trying to reform what I think is an unnecessary federal government boondoggle. But rather than reforming this, I think we need to eliminate this program. I'll just give you an example, Mr. Speaker. So many of us were uh, very strongly opposed to Obamacare, the government takeover of health care, because we didn't believe the federal government should be uh, uh, in, uh, running the health care for our entire nation. But apparently we have no problem with the federal government running a national flood insurance program. This program was created in 1968. We started writing policies in 72, uh, and today this program is almost $18 billion in debt. And FEMA says that this debt will never be paid off. Never, never be paid off. So not only is the federal government improperly running a flood insurance program, it's operating a very bad flood insurance program. This program is not actuarially sound. It charges some of the highest risk areas subsidized rates and charges other areas of no risk astronomical rates 
to pay for those subsidies. And you can use my home state of Michigan as a great example where our residents have been forced into this program, charged thousands of dollars in every year, even though there's, we have almost no risk of flooding. In Michigan, we actually look down at the water, not up at the water. We paid multiple times more in premiums than we've ever received back in benefits. In short, Mr. Speaker, the people of the great state of Michigan are getting fleeced by this program. Now, obviously, we are a compassionate nation, and, and we have a case of a natural disaster or what have you. We need to make sure that we step up and give relief to our, our fellow Americans. But what we're doing here today is simply not fair. What we should have is a natural catastrophic fund so that everybody pays, not just some who are being forced to subsidize others. That is not fair. So, Mr. Speaker, I would hope that my colleagues would join me in rejecting the reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program so that we can get to work on a way to allow the private marketplace to move in and to replace it. I yield back my time. The gentleman who yields back, the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Yes, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hinojoso, for uh, two minutes. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Congressman Scott. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong support of the National Flood Insurance Program, and I urge support both sides of the aisle for the 30-day extension today, H.R. 5740. I would like to thank my friend, Congresswoman Maxine Waters from California, and my esteemed colleague, Congresswoman Judy Biggert of Illinois, for their work on this bill and H.R. 1309 which I proudly co-sponsored. Ideally, we should be increasing certainty for homeowners by reauthorizing the program for five years, as affected by H.R. 1309, which passed the House last July with over 400 votes. Now it waits for Senate action. I respectfully urge our counterparts in the Senate to pass a longer-term authorization. Since 2008, the National Flood Insurance Program was operated on several short-term extensions, which only increases uncertainty in the housing market. As hurricane season approaches, Congress needs to act with all diligence to provide stability for the housing market and to give peace of mind to homeowners. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Dole, a member of the committee. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly want to thank my good friend from Illinois for her leadership and for giving me some time. I, I, today, I rise in strong support of H.R. 5740. Mr. Speaker, history of American flood disasters has clearly shown us two things. First, an effective and proactive national flood insurance program with paid-in premiums is a much better deal for taxpayers than the after-the-fact federal disaster assistance, which was the inevitable federal response to flood disasters before this program's inception. Second, any lapse in the program's authorization irreparably damages our mortgage and real estate markets, and avoiding that irreparable damage is particularly important right now, and those markets are already so seriously challenged. Although reauthorization is essential, we also recognize that the program needs meaningful reforms. We must gradually diminish taxpayer exposure to flood losses while improving the program's solvency and self-sufficiency. And we must work with the private sector to expand its role in protecting against flood disasters. Under Chairwoman Biggert's leadership, a long-term reauthorization bill with the necessary reforms, H.R. 1309, passed out of the Financial Services Committee, Mr. Speaker, unanimously, 54 to 0. And then the same bill received nearly unanimous support right down here, bipartisan support. Over 400 members voted in favor. With that kind of overwhelming bipartisan support, I must say that it's a little frustrating that we're here once again discussing short-term reauthorization, largely because the other body hasn't considered the long-term bill, even though the long-term bill was passed out of the Senate Banking Committee by voice vote. One thing that seems clear is that the strategy of short-term authorizations, the corresponding temporary program lapses, and uncertainty does not work to minimize taxpayer risk or expand the private sector's role. But we must deal with the existing realities. 
To properly reform and strengthen this program, we need to reauthorize this program on a long-term basis, and we need to do so promptly. But the Senate hasn't acted, and we can't tolerate any lapse in the program. So I strongly urge my colleagues to support H.R. 5740, which will avoid a destructive program lapse while we continue to work towards the long-term authorizations. I want to thank my, my colleague, Ms. Biggert, for her leadership. I want to thank the ranking member, or Ms. Waters, for her leadership as well. And I yield back. The time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself what time I may need. Um, the Let gentleman just, is recognized. Thank you. Let me just respond uh, very briefly. There's a great urgency here. There is a very serious cry coming from the American people. And that cry is saying, help us. And the kind of help we need is to prepare for the storm before, before the hurricane is raging. We, 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 we live in Stone Alley. Now, I can tell you from first experience, first-hand experience, I represent a district in the state of Georgia, and in 2010, I believe it was, we had the worst flood in over 500 years. Uh, I represent the Chattahoochee River, which overflowed. I represent one county. We had 10 people lost their lives. And, and seven of those people were from one county in my district, in Douglas County. Cobb County had losses. We got on Air Force, I guess we call it Air Force Two, with Vice President Biden, and we flew down with FEMA and Homeland Security, and we toured that place. I'm sure you all saw on CNN and Fox and MSNBC and all the news stations, where uh, Six Flags Over Georgia, the amusement park, totally underwater. So I, 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 I can speak for my community and my area. As, as th those of us in the House have spoken, over 400 strong. And why in the world the United States Senate is sitting on the reauthorization is a mystery with the cry coming from the American people. Now, our season is on us. The hurricane season starts in two weeks. Now, let me just tell you, I've heard from uh, one of the individuals on the other side, I wanted to respond to some of those concerns why this bill is so important. Our reauthorization bill would require annual notifications to homeowners who are living in flood zones about the risk in their community. Many people move into these areas. They don't even know they're in a flood zone. Well, we got in this bill that they will be notified every year. They need that information so they can make the adjustments. And as I mentioned, the affordable uh, insurance coverage. I need not mention the flood maps themselves, many of which all throughout this country are outdated, leaving many of your constituents, my constituents, I hope the Senate is hearing because they're their constituents as well, at risk for flood damage without even their knowledge. Let, let's hope that this message gets across to the Senate, that we need action. The American people are crying for help, and we need to give it to them immediately. We got two weeks to do it, and we dare not let this hurricane season come in here and with this flood insurance program expired. Uh, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield uh, one, one and one half minutes to the gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Duffy, a member of the Financial Services Committee. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you. I, I first want to recognize the gentlelady from uh, Illinois, Ms. Biggert, and uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Waters, for their great and hard work on the reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. While I arrive today in support of this short-term extension, uh, I have to be frank and honest and tell you that I'm disappointed that we uh, haven't found both chambers coming together uh, to reauthorize this program for five years. Uh, what this does is it creates uncertainty in the market 
for the individuals who may have a home in a floodplain or a community that has many uh, of its pieces of property in a floodplain uh, without having a long-term bill that creates uncertainty for them. It creates uncertainty in the housing market, uh, which has gone through uh, uh, obviously some very uh, strenuous times since the 2008 uh, financial crisis. This uh, legislation, a long-term fix, would help breed certainty in that market as, uh, as well. And as we look back last summer, we passed this legislation. Uh, both sides of the aisle coming together doesn't happen very often. It was one of those uh, great moments in the House where it was a, a vote of 406 to 22. Both Republicans and Democrats joining hands passing this legislation. Now we're just waiting for the Senate to act. It's a bill that's going to save $4.2 billion over the course of 10 years. And it uh, includes reforms, reforms that are going to uh, save taxpayers money by eliminating unnecessary rate subsidies and encouraging the development of a private flood insurance market. I support the short-term extension, but also encourage the Senate to act. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Um, I reserve the balance of my time. I ask Ms. Uh, the lady from Illinois has the right to close. Uh, or you have any more speakers? Uh, I think we have uh, just one more speaker. Okay. One, one more reserve. speaker. The gentleman uh, reserves the balance of his time. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized. At this time, I'd like to uh, uh, yield uh, one, point, one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for one and one half minutes. All right. Mr. Speaker, once again, we find that good legislation that was passed by the House has been taken hostage by the Senate. As we approach yet another deadline on the reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program, the Senate is refusing to take up our long-term solution. Ten months ago, we passed a five-year bill that would bring much-needed certainty and stability to the people depending on this program. The short-term package before us today fails to provide a long-term solution to a very real long-term problem. NFIP provides flood insurance to more than 20,000 communities across this nation, including more than 50,000 families in my district. Many of my constituents in Mississippi are still dealing with the effects of Hurricane Katrina. They have experienced record flooding in recent years, and we are fast approaching another hurricane season. We have no other choice. We must act now. So it is out of necessity that I support this short-term extension. But we must remain focused on a longer-term solution for the sake of those in the Gulf Coast states and high-risk flood areas. They depend on the National Flood Insurance Program. Between now and the next time this extension expires, I urge my colleagues in the Senate to revisit and embrace H.R. 1309, our five-year solution. I yield back. Yields back. The gentleman from Georgia. Yes, thank you. Um, I will close with my remarks. Uh, I, I, I hope that uh, I'm hoping that perhaps members of the Senate may be watching C-SPAN uh, and, and, and watching us in the House. If not, I just simply urge their constituents to give them a call, ask them to move. It, it would be great to move on uh, 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 House Resolution 1309, because even if you do this temporary one, it's 30 days. We're right back here in another four weeks at the time that hurricanes are raging. Uh, we, 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 are, we are really playing with fire here, and we're not doing the American people justice, and we're not doing right here. Uh, as the gentleman from Louisiana just mentioned, uh, vivid in our minds has got to be Katrina. We can talk about Andrew in Florida. You can talk about Hazel up in New York. Our whole country is coastline. And flooding is the worst natural disaster in our, in our country in terms of loss of life, in terms of property. And folks need this financial assistance from this flood insurance program. So I just urge my colleagues in the Senate to move and do the right thing. I urge the American people to contact their senators and let them know we do not need to be standing naked in the face of fierce hurricanes without help, without support, simply because the United States Senate failed to act in the best interest of the American people. And with that, I uh, yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, members are also reminded to direct their remarks to the chair and not to the viewing audience.
The gentlewoman from Illinois is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I uh, yield myself the balance of, of my time. And I thank the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Scott, for managing this bill and, and for all of his uh, 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 mention of how important this is. And I also would uh, again like to thank uh, Ms. the gentlelady from California, Ms. Waters, for, for being a uh, co-sponsor. Mr. Speaker, I wish we did not have to be here on the floor once again with short-term extension of the NFIP, but this program is too important to homeowners, to the housing market, and to the communities in the flood-prone uh, areas for Congress to let it expire at the end of the month. It is also too in debt to continue without reform. And despite our best efforts in the House, the Senate has been unwilling or unable to pass a long-term NFIP reauthorization and reform bill. As has been mentioned over and over, the House passed our five-year NFIP reauthorization reform bill, H.R. 1309, last July with overwhelming bipartisan majority of more than 400 votes. It also won unanimous support in the Financial Services Committee. But the Senate has not yet uh, approved any version of flood reform. So here we are once again on the verge of a lapse in NFIP. Mr. Speaker, the time has come to stop playing games with this important program and start enacting long-term reforms now. With today's bill, we begin that process. First, it extends the program for an additional month to spare property owners and the housing market from another lapse. In addition, it would initiate several non-controversial reforms to de develop private sector options in the flood insurance market. This is all part of the, the uh, five-year bill that we have. Reforming the NFIP is, too, is simply too important to ignore. Our extension will give the Senate time to, to, to act, and it will begin the process of fixing NFIP to protect taxpayers from unnecessary risk. With that, I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 5740, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady has yielded back the balance of her time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 5740? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection, um, the motion to reconsider is laid Mr. on the table. The gentleman from I Georgia. Uh, I demand the ayes and nays, Mr. Speaker. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. For what, for what Mr. Speaker, I ask for uh, unanimous, unanimous consent to correct um, my earlier vote. Mr. Speaker, I unintentionally voted A on the roll call number 253 when I intended to vote no on the motion to consider H.R. 656 providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 4970 to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act of 1994 and providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 4310 the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2013. I reiterate my strong support for the protection of women from acts of violence and my opposition to the reauthorization as currently written and brought forth. The gentleman's statement will appear in the record. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow, rise? Mr. Speaker, under Rule 22, Clause 7C, I hereby announce my intention to offer a motion to instruct on H.R. 4348, the conference report to extend federal highway programs. The form of the motion is as follows. I move that the managers on the part of the House at the conference on the disagreeing votes of the two houses on the Senate amendment to the bill H.R. 4348 be instructed to insist on Title II of the House bill regarding approval of the Keystone XL pipeline. The gentleman's notice will appear in the record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
purposes, the gentleman from California and seek recognition. Mr. Speaker, I ask uh, unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous material on H.R. 4310. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 656 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 4310. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 4310, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2013 for military activities of the Department of Defense to prescribe military personnel strengths for fiscal year 2013 and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself such time as I might consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2013, which overwhelmingly passed the Committee on Armed Services. In keeping with the committee's tradition of bipartisanship, Ranking Member Smith and I worked collaboratively to produce this bill and solicited input from each of our members. The legislation advances our national security objectives provides support and logistical resources for our warfighters, and helps the United States confront the national security challenges of the 21st century. The bill authorizes $554 billion for national defense in the base budget, consistent with the allocation provided by the House Budget Committee. It also authorizes $88.5 billion for overseas contingency operations. The legislation continues my priorities set forth when I was elected chairman. It contains no earmarks. It carefully analyzes the Defense Department for inefficiencies and savings. It helps ensure the Pentagon's new national defense strategy is not a hollow one. And despite historic cuts to our wartime military, it plugs critical capability and strategic shortfalls opened in the President's budget submission. The National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2013 achieved these, achieves these goals by working to, number one, ensure our troops deployed in Afghanistan and globally, including the National Guard, who are the nation's first line of defense at home, have the equipment, the resources, the authorities, and the time and training they need to success, successfully complete their missions and return home safely. Number two, care for our warfighters, veterans, and their families with the support they earned through their service. Three, provides critical strategic capabilities in an era of austerity. Fourth, it mandates fiscal responsibility, transparency, and accountability within the Department of Defense. And finally, improves the relationship between the Defense Department and the supporting industrial base by eliminating red tape and incentivizing competition. Mr. Chairman, in 2012, we affirmed that the President is authorized to detain certain al-Qaeda terrorists pursuant to the 2001 Authorization for Use of Military Force, or AUMF. Ten years after the horrific attacks of 9-11, it was time for Congress to once again ensure that our men and women in uniform have the authority they need to continue to fight and win the war on terror. Foreign terrorist groups such as al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula still pose a grave threat to all U.S. citizens. As a result of last year's bill, we've heard from a number of concerned citizens wondering what this affirmation meant in relation to the rights of U.S. citizens. As a result, in this year's bill, we've incorporated Representative Scott Rigel and Jeff Landry's Right to Habeas Corpus Act, which affirms the availability of the great writ of habeas corpus to any person detained in the United States pursuant 
to the AUMF. As we all know, the writ of habeas corpus is the ultimate protection against any unlawful detention by the executive. I'm especially proud of the bipartisan work done on defense industry reform. We have several provisions in our bill that adopt bipartisan recommendations to improve the relationship between the Pentagon and the defense industry. In a time of declining defense budgets, we can no longer afford to conduct business as usual. This bill encourages small businesses to compete for Pentagon contracts and closely scrutinizes every penny that the taxpayers send to the armed forces. Finally, in light of the Pentagon's new national security strategy, it's Congress' constitutional obligation to ensure this new force posture is not a hollow one. To that end, we provide modest increases in combat capabilities with particular emphasis on our Navy fleet and critical intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms. I thank the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Rules Committee for working with us to bring this measure to the floor. I urge all of my colleagues to support passage of this bill. In partnership with you, we look forward to passing the 51st Consecutive National Defense Authorization Act. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself three minutes. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Chairman McKeon, uh, the committee.